On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. everybody i'm here with trevor swartz of the colorado rockies organization trevor thanks for coming on man appreciate your time tell the listeners about yourself if you would please yeah for sure uh thank you again for having me but uh just diving into it i'm the physical performance coordinator for the colorado rockies um roles and responsibilities um just to name a few um staff education ordering supplements um creating the schedules for spring training instructs um, traveling to the affiliates to work with other coaches, and then primarily my job when I'm on the floor is working with the rehab guys. Gotcha. And so kind of go into your journey into this role. Not everybody just jumps right into that coordinator role. What kind of led you into this role? Uh, for me, I would say my past probably been the most unconventional out of anybody. Um, typically, you hear guys, oh, I started in A-ball and worked my way up to AAA, and I actually went down every year. <laughs> um, I was hired part-time in – 2014 at uh, 23 years old and um, was an A-ball next year, was hired full-time, um, actually got sent to short season to run our extended spring training program. And then the next year went to Grand Junction to work with our rookie league team. So I went down every year as compared to going up. And then um, our former coordinator um, left and the position came open and they said, Hey, we've kind of noticed you've been leading a lot of things. So we want to kind of take you to that next step and put you in this role and this is going to be next year will be year three as the coordinator. So it's been uh, a little unconventional. I think you talk to most strength coaches and they do their college internships and GA positions. And I've had, I got hired out of my undergrad. So I've been very unconventional with my way to get here. So. Yeah. One of the overlooked parts of working those shorter seasons though, is you get extended and you work those other things and, if you do it right, you can kind of see how everything works so that when you get into that role, you have an awareness where if you're a double-A, triple-A guy, like when you leave for the full season, you don't necessarily see extended or how that works. So you don't get that type of experience. Yeah, exactly. And that first year kind of running it as a full season or the short season guy and being full-time, it was a little interesting because we saw coordinators, but they were at triple-A in the big leagues. We did a split that year and it was just weird kind of that dynamic, but they said, Hey, you got it, run it. And if you need help, just call us and ask, but we trust you. And so that was kind of the big learning moment for me was looking at kind of the global picture of what's going on in the organization and not looking at just that team you're working with. Right. Yeah. And that's really good advice for the listeners to take that big picture and, and kind of put all the pieces together in your mind. Cause you never know what position you're going to end up in. Yeah. And just take everything with a grain of salt and, so, I mean, my dad said it best, put your head down and work. So that's kind of been my mantra as I've gone along. So, Yeah, I love yeah. that. I'm a huge uh, work <laughs> ethic guy. So <laughs> yeah. my dad told me the same thing growing up. So, um, But I want to get into it. I want to hear your best professional baseball story. I've been asking a lot of people this question lately, and it might be, you know, a success story or something that got lost in translation or just, you know, whatever it is that is the best memory you have from professional baseball. So this is going to be a little different. Um, like I said, it's been very unconventional for me. Um, I've been very fortunate to have good people around me. Um, my first off season is what I want to talk about because, you know, we've all had those stories in baseball where, you know, in season you see some guy do something stupid and it's funny and everybody laughs about it. And, you know, we all have that experience. But I think for me, uh, my first off season here, we always work our off season camps um, and it's just open throughout the off season. So, I got asked to come down my first full year um, and work the camp. Didn't have a place to live, and I was very fortunate. Mike Jasperson, our assistant big league guy, asked me to come live with him and his friend Adam Hour. And so I was Adam's the AAA guy with the Angels, or now he's the big league guy. Sorry, assistant big league guy. <laughs> um, and that first off season was living with them. So for me, it was kind of a grassroots upbringing and strength and conditioning at 24, not having that typical experience that everybody had. So community with Mike to work in the mornings and listening to podcasts and then getting to work. And it was him and Brian Buck and I, and we're sitting there and they would be quizzing me on stuff that was going on on the floor and working with me and saying, Hey, you need to do this and take this approach today. Or, you know, you're going to lead the session today. And then coming home with Mike and then Adam and I sitting around at 
at night out on the patio just eating dinner and talking shop about strength conditioning. So for me, it was that first off season, just getting into it and having this kind of underground approach to learning and being with those guys was just phenomenal for me. So that's, that's my story. No, those are really, favorite. really good names to learn from too. Yeah. So and it's been, I credit a lot to those three. Those three have been a lot of big influences and um, I'm very grateful to have those guys in my corner and very close friends too. Yeah. I was going to say you probably still keep in touch with them and bounce ideas and everything off of each other. Oh yeah. Uh, winter meetings was fun because Brian was out there. So all of us kind of got together and, you know, we were talking shop just like the old days. So it was a lot of fun for us to kind of meet up and see everybody. So it was cool. Yeah, for sure. So yeah. what do you believe in within strength and condition that others think you are crazy for believing? Um, well, Bucky kind of stole my thunder when he was on here with that. <laughs> um, I think kind of our approach that we took starting, it's now year seven, we've been doing our program here. This is my sixth year with it. Um, the running three days a week and then lifting heavy in season. I think when we started, it was so, um, what's the word I'm looking for? taboo it wasn't it wasn't the thing to do and everybody was like well you guys aren't running you guys are lifting heavy like I had guys in season in August you know back squatting 365 for a single my first year and seeing that and watching everybody else my first year couple years and seeing how everybody was running every day and everybody's doing all this stuff on the field and we were like okay well we're trying to educate players and you know we're gonna go heavy and we're gonna run less and I think that was kind of the biggest thing for us as a department was, okay, like this is what we believe in and this is what we're going with. And it's turned out to be really good. And um, it was a process. It was a very big process, not just from our profession, but within the coaching staffs as well. Cause you get the older coaches that, well, I ran every day and you know, I never lifted weight. And it was like, well, yeah, but that was then the science and everything has kind of led us to this point and we're just trying to make it better for the next people that are coming through. And it's cool now because there are guys that I had my first year that are retired now and actually are coaches on our staffs. And they're preaching the message that we were telling them five years ago to the players. So that buy-in now is just getting kind of extrapolated with the new coaches that are coming in. Yeah, a couple of things there. First, like back in the day, if you lifted weights, you were kind of the outlier. And nowadays, like if you don't lift weights, you're you're the outlier. And the yeah. second is, like you said, you're getting buy-in from guys because they don't have to run as much. So when you, they do run, you expect them to run hard and you expect them to lift hard because you're not giving them as much to do. Um, and I think a lot of players probably buy into that, like, okay, I don't have to do this, but when I'm asked to do something, I need to do it. And it sounds like your new coaches who were in your system totally bought into it. Yeah. And it's been cool the last couple of years, especially being a coordinator. And I spend a lot of time at the short season affiliates when we get our new draft picks and I sit down one-on-one -on -one with each guy and go, okay, you know, what's your training age? What type of movements are you familiar with? What did you do in college? And just speaking on the college sector alone, seeing what's coming out of there, these guys know how to lift. These guys are doing most of the same conditioning we're doing now at the college level. So they're coming in with the ex knowing those things, and that's our expectation now. And it's made this transition over the last couple of years with these new players coming in for our system. It's made it a lot easier for them to kind of adhere to the program and understand what's going on. And they buy in right away. So yeah. that's been the coolest thing for us. Yes, yeah, some, some of the college coaches that I know, just out of experience, they like the heavy lifting and the sprint work. And so the, the smoother that transition can be for those guys once they get into pro ball, because then they have to worry about all the early work of pro ball and playing every day and the travel and the things that they might not be used to. At least that lifting and conditioning program is a little bit more familiar. So it makes that part an easier transition. Yeah, for sure. It's been, like I said, it's been great. And, um, Kudos to the college sector for kind of getting these guys ready. It's been, I know my first year in Boise, which is my second year uh, with the Rockies, it was tough. I mean, we had kind of a mixed bag of guys, JUCO guys and college guys. And then now it's pretty much every program, guys are back squatting, guys are deadlifting, guys are trap barring. Everybody's, you know, rear foot elevated split squatting to some degree. We're running sprints. So it's cool to see kind of that change over time uh, happen. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you're a coordinator. I'm sure you've hired at least somebody while you're there. And I want to know what makes a strength and conditioning coach successful to you. When you hire somebody, 
what are you looking for them to do to be successful, maybe just in general as a person, and then more specifically in professional baseball? So for me, I think the word we like to use is compliance um, on our staff. So are you getting compliance with your athletes? Are, you getting, are we getting compliance from new staff members coming in? Um, I think it's kind of a multifaceted answer where compliance has so many different things. Um, are you sitting down and talking? Are you communicating? Sitting down and talking with guys? Um, are you getting them to listen to what you're saying, whether it be about nutrition or lifting? Um, getting guys to buy into that message you're saying. And I think that's true at all levels as a strength coach is how can you get that compliance? How do you, how do you best get that out of your guys? I remember my first year, we do everything based on logging percentages. My first year, I think we were shooting for like 40% compliance in terms of guys logging workouts. And I think last year we were something like 85 to 90%. And that 15% was probably just because of off days and, you know, travel days and season. So compliance wise now for us, you know, we have guys logging, guys are asking questions. And so I think that's the biggest marker for me when I'm looking and evaluating these coaches we bring in is how can you get that compliance with our guys? And how can you comply with the system that we have? And so I think being compliant is probably the biggest thing as a coach. Yeah, for sure. And it sounds like uh, it was back to even that lifting, you know, talk that we just had of how it's a process of, okay, it started at 40% compliance and now it's 80, 85. And then you hope like next year it's 95 and a hundred percent. Yeah. It takes a little bit of time, but once it gets rolling, it gets rolling. Yeah. And it's just those battles that you have to face. I mean, having those awkward conversations. And again, it's, I think it's, Compliance is such a multifaceted answer. There's so many things that go into it. Are you passionate about strength conditioning? Are you passionate about baseball? How is that going to feed your communication with that athlete? So I think it just encompasses so many different things that I think we often take for granted as coaches sometimes. Yeah, I think specifically in professional baseball, you have to have a little bit of a passion for the game of baseball in addition to your strength and conditioning or the schedule will eat you alive. It's going to kill you. <laughs> it's going to kill you. Yeah, for sure. Just it, whether you're in short season or a full season, it's it's definitely uh, not for everybody if they don't enjoy watching baseball games and being around it. Yeah, it's cool seeing guys that have been around the game and seeing how they take it. And they may not be the best strength conditioning coaches, but they learn it over time. And that's, I think, what makes them great. For and sure. So you kind of see that kind of both sides of the spectrum when guys come in. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, what advice do you have for others in the field? Maybe young coaches that are looking to get in or even older coaches who are just looking to stay on top of things? For me, I would probably say be under constant evaluation, self-evaluation, evaluating your work. Um, that's one thing I'm always thinking about. Okay, what did I say during this session? How can I improve it? Was the message heard? Evaluate your day. You know, what did I do that day that made me successful? Um, it's funny, my girlfriend, her cousins, they do a thing with their two year old. They say, what's your high low? So every day I sit down at the end of the day and I write down a high and a low. So I'm trying to constantly be in that state of evaluation where, okay, my low was, I didn't, you know, order supplements that day or something like that. I need to do that tomorrow to make it better. So it's how can you always be in that evaluative state to get better? It's, this is kind of a theme that's been coming up more as I interview um, coaches that are in like the coordinator role or the big league role that have been around a while. The self-evaluation um, aspect of it is so huge. Um, and there are definitely things that I'm starting to take away myself. Um, and this is definitely a good one, the high-low. I try to keep like a journal every day, but I might have to add that in just to be a little bit more specific. I think the more specific you can be with your self-evaluation, the better. Yeah, and... That's a, it's a process. I got to tell you, because I know last year is my first year as the coordinator was tough. I felt like I was just swimming to catch up. And then this year it was taking those lessons I learned from the year before, the mistakes I made and applying that to this year. And it made my life a whole lot easier. Um, one of our coaches who's no longer with us, Max Torres in instructs, he was there both years with me. And he said the first year, he's like, you just seemed like you were just swimming around. You had like running around. And he's like, this year you really came into your own. You were very calm and collected and things went very smooth. He's like, that, you kind of came into your own. And I was like, well, yeah, it took a year of me looking back on what was going on and trying to change things daily to get me to that point. And I'm still doing it. I'm still trying to figure out ways to make it better for next year. And how is it going to impact the staff and the players in the organization? Yeah, I think the best are constantly self-evaluating. And it's hard to do. It really, really is to look in the mirror and be like, I messed up here or I need to do this better. But I really do think the best are always self-evaluating. 
Yeah, and I think and just seeing other coaches talking about it, um, I've been fortunate to go up to Altus and see it. Those guys up there do a tremendous job. Um, you listen to Stu and Dan Path talk, and they're always in the same mindset of what's about it, like what are we doing, how are we evaluating it, and that's kind of the message they harp on is you know communicate with other coaches and also be in that evaluative process. So it's been cool to kind of see that from an outside perspective. Yeah, it's funny how long they've been doing it and they're still like the most humble guys you'll meet and the most open-minded and like they just want to keep learning and keep getting better for the sake of their athletes. Absolutely, yeah. And it's that's it's one of the best cultures I've ever seen, not just in the weight room, but in sport in general, yeah. on how they approach things. So Ag- Agreed, 100%. So where are you going uh, for continuing ed? Any books that you would recommend or seminars to attend, podcasts to listen to? Where are you going for continuing ed? Okay, so I've got a list here of each thing, so we'll start with books. I'm a big list guy. Um, books, um, Intent, it's on sports science for athletic development. Uh, Max Torres actually recommended that to me, and I read it over the summer. Um, it's a short read, but kind of dives into how to apply sports science applications into small team setting. So you may not have a big budget, but you can still get heart rate every day from guys on the cheap and make it work to evaluate your program. So that was one book I really enjoyed. Um, the Governing Dynamics of Coaching by James Smith. Um, James gets a little wordy, <laughs> um, but that one was pretty influential in just talking about um, the evaluative process of coaching and how organizations should be ran. Kind of a different thought process from someone who's now a consultant and coming in and saying, okay, like this is how it should be. And kind of the line he takes away from it is um, – Sport in and of itself is in its relative infancy. I mean, it's only baseball's only been around for about 150 years, so we're still in its infancy in the context relative to human um, evolution. So we're still learning and adapting these new processes. And that book was fascinating for me. And then I'm actually diving into Game Changer right now by Fergus Conley, um, like two chapters in. So I just got into that one, um, and I'm working through the Altus Foundation course. So I'm kind of scatterbrained right now. Um, seminars. Uh, FRC, uh, I did that one in January. By far the best seminar I've ever been to. Um, Spinea was the instructor for mine. Uh, just the way he goes about it. Um, clear, concise. Uh, just gives you a different perspective on mobility and how it should be approached. Um, and actually, me and Mike Jasperson are going to do the King's Stretch seminar in January now. So we're going to have to do that to kind of take it a step further. And then the Altus ACP course. Um, I've gone to that. I've been invited twice to go just for a couple of days. Um, by far one of the best experiences ever. Um, the roundtable discussions at the end of the day, going and looking at the track sessions and just the different types of coaches they bring in. Um, I was at one with Steve Magnus. It was phenomenal. Um, just listening to other people talk from different sports and it, it was fantastic. So I definitely recommend that. Um, podcasts. This one, obviously, um, All Things Strength and Wellness by Robbie Burke is a good one. Um, he brings on a lot of good people. I really like that one. Brian Buck actually got me into that. And then the Physical Preparation Podcast. I like Mike Robinson and how he goes about it. It's a good one. And then uh, the Joe Rogan Experience. I think just having that diverse population come in and listening to, you know, you could have a psychologist on one week and the next week you got a comedian on there. But you can take something away from each one. And I think that's that's probably probably my go-to one. Is I just like listen to that in the car sometimes, just to hear different people talk. Yeah, my dad and I drove out from Buffalo area out to Phoenix when I moved out here after the season, and I had never listened to Joe Rogan. And I I downloaded a whole bunch of them because everybody said they're good. And we listened to Joe Rogan the whole way. I don't think we put on music once. It was like. Steve-O was on one, and then like this guy, and then that guy, and like you said, you can take something from everybody on there, regardless of who they are, and it's, you know, it gets a little out there sometimes, but like, it's just very entertaining to listen to, and it makes the drive go really, really fast. Absolutely, and he does a really good job in just posing questions, I think how he, he doesn't bait the person he's talking to, but he gets to, he draws that information out of them that... He does a really good job, and I, I love listening to that one. Yeah, agreed. So. I'm downloading them all the time, and they come out so frequently. I'm like, yes, new content all the time. So, yeah. But all the other ones on this list are really good, too, but I, I had to make a little note about Joe Rogan there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to do a lightning round with you. What do you got? You got time? Bring it on. 
All right, first one. Who is your biggest influence in the field of strength and conditioning? So I got a long list for this one. Can I, can I go through my That's list okay. here? Go through the list. Okay. Um, my first mentor was Dan Potts. Um, he was my high school strength coach. Um, unfortunately, he passed away six years ago, but was the guy that kind of got me in, um, pushed me into this profession, um, and kind of taught me what it meant to be a coach. Um, Phil Wagner, Sparta Science, um, another big influence just in how he shaped our mindset as a staff, um, coming in as a consultant and having us sit down and talk and we had to remove the ego at the door. And so us having very blunt conversations with each other was a way for us to grow as a staff. And that's what he brought to the table. And then, um, I like to call it my kind of coaching tree. These are all my close friends and mentors, uh, Mike Jasperson, Brian Buck, Adam Auer, Al Sandoval, uh, my staff here, Gabe Bauer, Marcus Lefton, Phil Bailey. Um, surrounding yourself with the right people, I think is key. And having people like that is phenomenal. And I get to learn from those guys. And Al called me a couple weeks ago to talk about the FRC course. And we ended up having a two and a half hour phone call. Like, so those are the types of things that happen. Like we just get going on stuff and we can just jam. And I, I'm very grateful for all those people. So, yeah, I think every single person should have that kind of close group where if they call and like, okay, I only have 15 minutes, let's make it quick. And the next thing you know, you're two hours deep in a conversation. Like, I think everybody needs that group of people in their life. Yeah, and it, I think it just grows you as a person. And um, all those guys, I mean, they push you. And I push them, and it's we have a very tight group of coaches. And it's very fun to have those guys around. Yeah, and like so. I said earlier, that's a, that's a really good group to have. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, One piece of equipment to train with, what would it be? Barbell. Yeah, I, had, I, I think had that's probably the most common answer is barbell. <laughs> yeah, you get a kettlebell a lot in baseball too, just because you can take it on the road and it's pretty, uh, pretty versatile piece of equipment. But yeah, the barbell is is pretty common. Yeah. Uh, biggest accomplishment professionally and or personally? Uh, personally, uh, probably my Eagle Scout. I got that when I was 16. So that was probably my biggest personal one. Um, professionally, um, kind of hard. I like to do team stuff. So we won the South Atlantic league my first year. So probably that, um, as a professional and then obviously being the coordinator and being in this position, um, professionally is, it's a big step. And, uh, but that 2014 team was special and that, that I hold that one near and dear to my heart. Last one, any career other than strength and conditioning, what would you choose? Uh, firefighting or EMT. Really? Yeah. I was actually going to be a firefighter, um, out of high school, and then decided to play college baseball instead. So, um, yeah, it's always the fallback option if I need to get out of here. But I'm having too much fun. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. This is a, a great life to live. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so if the listeners want to get in touch with you, my man, where can we get more? Social media or is there a better place to get in touch with you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I mostly do retweets. Um, I don't like putting stuff out. I'll throw a corny tweet out there, like some quote that I've heard that day. Um, that's T Swartz 9 S-W-A-R-T-Z. Um, if you want to give me a follow on Instagram, it's Trevor underscore Swartz 9. Um, that's more of a personal page, but doesn't matter to me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I appreciate your time, man, and uh, we'll be talking soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. That concludes this episode with Trevor. I hope you enjoyed this one. It was really cool to hear his unconventional path and his thoughts on in-season training and self-evaluation. Three things that I took from Trevor – Look at the global picture of what is going on, be under constant self-evaluation, and surround yourself with good people. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll talk to you again on the next one.